This episode of Shop Talk Live is brought to you by Audible. With an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more, get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at www.audible.com slash shop talk live. Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host, Ben Strano, filling in for a vacationing Tom McKenna. And with me this week is creative director, Mike Pekovich. Hey. And uh, no one else. We got Jeff here. Hey, hello. So I guess that means I'm filling in for Matt Kenny. I was going to try and write something clever in like that, but then yeah. I was like, mm. right. So, like, everybody's on vacation right now. Yeah. Except Matt's us. out. Anissa's out. Jeff and I are about to go to Philadelphia. But that's we're, not we're, vacation. We're not vacationing <laughs> together. <laughs> we're not vacationing together. Could, could be worse, though. Um, I wanted to quickly mention uh, the fine folks over at the Taunton store just uh, made us a promo code for our listeners. Hmm. So uh, if you go to tauntonstore.com, you can get 20% off anything if you use the uh, discount code SHOPTALK. Oh. So if you don't subscribe and you want to subscribe, you can do that through the Taunton store and get 20% off. Is it like one item or everything you buy? Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Did I just burst the bubble? <laughs> I really thought I was prepared for that. No. Wow. Thanks, cool. Mike. That Asking it, the hard questions. That includes a subscription, right? Yes, it includes a subscription. Wow. Uh, and like anything that's not discounted already or previous purchases or, I don't know, there's a list. Wow. I would put that towards like a three-year subscription and really leverage that 20%. Because the subscriptions are already discounted off the no. the. Newsstand price. So then we're really not making any money whatsoever. But we're having fun. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, it's not my money because I really don't care. <laughs> All right. Should we uh, dive into some questions? Sure. I have something for you first, oh. though. Um, I have something for you to smell. <laughs> uh, it's my latest. Um, and I, I think he's I, holding something. He's holding a tin. Yes. It is an old Goddard's cabinet maker's wax tin, the kind that the cool lemony scented wax came in, uh, which I ran out of. And I've been on like a sporadic two year quest to sort of make my own lemon scented wax. And I you've, think I'm. You've been chasing this rabbit for a long well, time. Well, it's sporadic. This is really, I think, my just my third or fourth batch of wax. Give it a smell. I can already. Okay. That smells, that smells lovely. That's good, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That really. It kind of smells like that Starbucks pound cake, that lemon <laughs> pound cake. So now I'm hungry. It's really good. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks. So, so I think I'm there. So, awesome. Good. So all those little Altoids tins uh, you were going to throw my way, uh, one will be coming back your way with some lemon-scented uh, Mike's Faux Goddard's Paste Wax. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So there you go. Rock on. I just said rock on. So we got that going for us. Yeah. Early, too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, question number one, and I can give you the recipe for the wax if you want. Do you want to give it on air? Sure. All right. Because it's in the magazine and it's on every. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of places online. Just look paste wax recipe. A lot of stuff comes up. It's basically a mix of paraffin beeswax and carnauba wax. With you need some sort of solvent to keep it um, not hard at room temperature, and that's. The problem I had is I started with um, turpentine because I thought that smelled good. It didn't. It smelled horrible. And then I went with... You uh, thought turpentine smelled good? I do. It's got a nice, I don't know, from my art school days. It's got a nice Pure kind of sizzle turpentine. on your nose hair. It smells like art class. Okay. And then I went with odorless mineral spirits, which was better, but it's still... And then along with some lemon, like the essential oil for the smell, that was still nasty. This time I went with the citrus thinner which was the key, along with... But isn't that orange? Yeah, but really, it's, it's really kind of neutral. So okay. it's an orange citrus thinner along with the lemon essential oil. And that's why it's just like... Bam. Right there. Okay. Pretty Sorry. impressive. Yep. So no ratios. I don't know what they are. Okay. I put them all in a crock pot. <laughs> I'm sure Rachel loves that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, she probably does think that's cool, so... Because she's pretty cool. Yeah, thanks. All right. <laughs> Question number one. I have a 400 1,000 grit combination diamond stone, a high-quality honing guide, and a leather strop. 
People always talk about removing the burr on the back of the blade after sharpening. I try and do that, but it seems to just bend back around and it doesn't come off. I end up with a tiny sliver of iron on the end of my blade, which is not straight, and that I can bend with my finger. Why is this happening? What am I doing wrong? From Theo. Uh, Theo, that's actually not a bad thing. You're not doing anything wrong. Um, Getting that little burr on there is really cool because it means that you're... Um, really close to getting really, really sharp. And whenever you see that, the last thing you want to do is try to pull it off. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, you'll leave like a really sort of rough serrated edge where that thing kind of rips off. Yeah. Um, The idea is to keep honing, um, you know, back and forth at your finest grit uh, with um, um, on the back and then also the bevel until that uh, abrades away and it'll just fall off like a little tiny kind of like a fingernail. Mm -hmm. And that means you're really, really sharp. That's that's a cool thing. I think your your problem might be the fact that you're only going up to a thousand grit diamond stone, and it might not be enough to um, give you a really uh, a high enough polish to where that abrades away. And then you have a leather strop. The strop should do it, but um, it might be too fine of a polish going jumping right from thousand grit to a strop. Um, what did he say? What he's charging the strop with? No, I'm guessing he's charging it with with some sort of honing compound. Um, but I would say, get yourself maybe you know if you're going to thousand grit diamond stone, you may also want to get like a four thousand, eight thousand water stone, mm-hmm. and you should be good. And the thing there is, you want to polish your back all the way up <laughs> to your highest grit. So take your back all the way up to say your eight thousand water stone. And then you never touch the back to anything except for the finest stones. So as you go through all your grits on the bevel and you create this burr, don't worry about it. It's going to stay there all the way until the end, Um, hit your 8,000. If it's still there, um, you want to flip it over and hit the back on 8,000. If it's still there, um, leave it in the honing guide, flip it around and take a few more passes on the bevel, then back to the back. And you should be able to abrade it away. And it's also, I find, it's the, the nature of... The steel in the tool, I find that softer carbon steel tools um, will often get that burr. Mm-hmm. And because it's softer, it will bend back and forth a little bit more. I find that A2 tends to not build a burr at all. It's very rare that I get one on A2 steel planes. It's rare that you get a burr? That that little wire edge. Oh, yeah, a large burr. But when yeah. you're honing, you, oh, you, can you, feel you by it. default get a little Yeah, burr. but yeah. not that little fingernail thing that actually yeah. stays abrades off and is sitting on your stone. And Japanese chisels, the steel is so hard that it tends to, it doesn't really fold back and forth. It tends to just sort of abrade away as you're sharpening. Mm-hmm. So it was really the old school uh, 01 steel plain irons or chisels where I got that the most. Um. The one thing that I struggled with was, especially after honing, after initial set, initially setting up a blade and getting it sharp and then going back and honing it, I was expecting that aggressive burr at yeah. the time. <clears throat> and realistically, the burr is fairly tiny once you're honing. Yeah. You can barely feel it. Um, and the, for me, the trick has been to, because I'm still, you know, I'm still learning, I'm still getting used to really getting a sharp blade. For me, the trick to feeling that burr and knowing when I have it is I I take my finger and I rub it, you know, as opposed to feeling for the burr just on the edge, I feel the, the unsharpened edge first and kind of get a reference for what that feels like. Oh. And then I feel for the burr on the on the sharpened edge of, of, of the tool. Okay. And it's, it's a lot more obvious to me then because I, I kept finding myself – going, wait, no, I don't have a burr, I don't have a burr. And realistically, I did have a burr. It just wasn't that super aggressive initial honing. Right, right off the grinder Right off burr. the grinder burr, yeah. that obnoxious burr, <laughs> yes. you know. Um, so he could possibly just be honing too much and getting too much of a burr. Um, I, don't th- I don't think so. I'm okay. going to say, well, I mean, it could be, yeah, if you're going back to your 400-grit diamond stone yeah. when you're honing – Maybe you're right because I do find the time you really get that wire edge is right off the grinder. Yeah. When I'm honing to your point, I'll go back to my thousand grit water stone to raise that burr again, but it's not enough to create that wire edge that abrades off. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. That's. I but think it that's is exactly enough right. to create 
a, a burr that you feel. Yes, you yes. definitely need to be able to feel it. Yes. Yep. Because if you're not creating that burr, you're not getting all the way to the edge. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, um, good luck, Theo. Yeah. Uh, I get a couple more stones or at least a, maybe another combination stone. One thing that um, one very inexpensive way of maybe upping your game would be to, uh, if you're using a leather strop, if you're charging it with like green compound or something like that, try switching to a piece of MDF with mm. that. I feel like you, you're you're less likely to um, dub the blade, which is rounding it over beef with the soft leather. Yeah, exactly. You want to keep that as as close to geometrically true as possible, at least for chisels and plain irons. For um, carving gouges, it doesn't matter if it's for rounded draw, over. For, for draw knives, you actually do want that to round over. Okay. So, but awesome. Well, let's uh, question number two from Eric. Is there a maximum board width you're comfortable with gluing up for a tabletop? I've heard that some wider boards are ripped down. So I've heard that some wider boards ripped down are somewhat more stable in the long run. I'm using some hickory for my top of a uh, coffee table, which I ended out, and the boards will be around 10 inches wide following stock prep. I prefer not to rip them down if I don't have to. Yeah, don't. Um, it's not more stable. It's it's the same board. Now it just has a glue joint in it. Um, is is maybe the thought ripping the board and flipping it over so that you the, any cupping is going to be? Yeah, I don't buy that um, because then you just when you rip and flip now you went from a wide board with basically perfectly matched grain because it's a single board to a, not only a glue line but also a glue line where the grain is not going to match because you're flipping the board. Mm -hmm. So the whole notion of, you know, it's a hard side down, hard side up, and you yeah. alternate that. And technically what you end up with is sort of a wavy pattern as those boards make up in the future. Mm -hmm. I would rather have a consistent curve that you could really sock down to, say, tabletop mm -hmm. aprons. And that'll keep, you know, it's a single curve that you're flattening as opposed to a bunch of waves, which you're never going to be able to sock that down flat, flat. Yeah. So um, the only reason I would rip wide boards for a tabletop is I've got just an eight inch joiner. So if I have like a 12 inch wide board, I may, you know, just rip that in half of the bandsaw, joint them, but I'll put them back in the same order. Mm -hmm. And the glue line is going to be really close to invisible because there's not a whole lot of stock that's removed and the, the orientation of the boards are going to be the same. So the chatoyance or luster is going to be consistent on either side of the glue line. So mm -hmm. um, that's no big deal. Or and, if, if you have a really cupped board, that you would trying to flatten it out take too much yeah. meat off. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a really great point. If you got a cup and a wide board, definitely rip that down. You reduce the cup by half, join and plane those things, put them back together. That's yes. I would say that's probably the primary reason, other than my skinny joiner, um, to do that. Where eight that inch, makes sense. Eight inch that. joiner is still a luxury for a lot of people. But uh, have have you yeah. ever done the planer sled? Because you have a fifteen inch planer, right? I have a 13 inch planer. What I will do, say, a big if, 13 inch planer. If I have a like a nine or 10 inch wide board, I'll pull the guard off my joiner, raise the blade for a fairly heavy cut, and I'll be able to take a pass on the board. It'll leave that one or two inch wide little ridge on mm -hmm. the outside where it wasn't cut, but I'll remove enough material across the bed of the joiner to give me a flat enough reference surface. And then I'll get an eight inch wide piece of MDF or plywood, the length of the stock, rest the stock on top of that. So that little lip is suspended up off of the planer table, oh. you know, face down. I can plane that opposite side face, flip it over and then plane off that original face with that step down to nothing. How far do you think you could use it? I mean, you, you couldn't do that with if someone had a six inch joiner, you couldn't do that with a 12 inch board, right? No, I think that's too much. Be tippy then. I'd say... Maybe as a rule of thumb, no more than one and a half times the width of your joiner. And even then, I'd say for a six inch, you can f definitely do like an eight inch wide board on a six inch joiner. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way for an eight inch, I feel maybe 10 or 11. If it were 12 inches, I might rip and join. Or I don't know. I've never done the thing where you make the planer sled and you wedge up a board so it doesn't rock and you mm -hmm. run it. Basically, you're turning your planer into a joiner. Yeah. It does work. I've seen people do it. We've done some articles on it. I've never really done that personally. We'd, we we uh, recently there was an article 
maybe a year or so ago. I'll have to dig it up and, and link to it. But um, and we did a video on it, and it, it it works really really well. It's a little finicky, but if that's your only option, yeah, that's your only option. You know, so um, I wouldn't. I, I used to have like a twenty inch long um, sled for small pieces okay. that I would hot milk glue things to and run through my planer. But um, my only problem with the sled scenario is, you know, if you've got a six foot long board, you have to have a six foot long sled. Yeah. So it's like, how many of these sleds are you going to make? Are you going to, you know. Just one six foot long. Well, then all of a sudden you have a seven foot long board, you know. So it's just you're that that's that's the only thing. So sure. I like I like that method of well, what are you using making, the MDF shim? What are you making with the seven foot long boards? I, a bed? Nope. <laughs> Is this a quiz now? <laughs> so I have to I have, before the end of this episode, I have to come up with a reasonable project for a seven it's door case. Uh, it's a, it's oh, a no, dining room. I'm not it's dining room tabletop. Yeah, okay. That's about the only thing. All right. So we'll we'll have a few comments. Well, I'm making a really tall chair. Well, it was huge Adirondack chairs on the <laughs> on the side of Route sixty six. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let's. Um, and the other reason I've never made that planer sled is because we have the sixteen inch joiner well, in the fine woodworking shop. So the best yeah. of the fine woodworking benefits. Yes. All right, let's uh, let's move on to our all time. We're flying. There's no one to argue with here. There's no digressions. <laughs> Just staying on topic yeah. and no snide comments. We miss Matt. All right. Um, all-time favorite tool of all time for this week. You want to go or you want me to go? Uh, 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 I'll go because I think you're going to have a lot to say about yours. Sure. So I'll, I'll be the opening band this all time right. around. Um. I wish Matt were here because he would get kind of mad at this, but my all-time favorite tool of all time. Rest assured, I I, I bet he's annoyed right now at something. At something. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, uh, is a clamping call, um, which may or may not be considered a tool. I'm considering it a tool this week. Um, clamping calls are very cool, and the reason why I'm bringing it up now is because I've just gone through a glue-up where – of a little arts and crafts display case carcass where um, the clamping calls really, it really kind of does a lot of things to make my life a lot easier. And basically what I'm doing is I'm gluing up the sides to the top and bottom and I have these through tenons uh, coming out the sides. So um, it's also really long, it's about 48 inches wide. So I'm just using these little flexi aluminum bar clamps and pulled out some pipe clamps as well with this short little jaws. So, I wanted to get clamping pressure right over the joint so it would come together square. I also wanted to transfer some clamping pressure to the center of the sides, which are about 13 inches wide. So I have a really tight glue gap, glue gap along the entire um, width of the top as it meets the sides, which is a really visible thing. So um, clamping calls basically let you direct clamping pressure exactly where you want it. And in this case, uh, I started with some oak blocks uh, as long as the case sides, and I ripped a groove in there just slightly wider than the tenons so I could center these right over the tenons for clearance but still apply pressure square across the joint. In addition, I taped an eighth-inch thick shim um, to the center of the call. that basically turns it into a curved clamping call. That's slick. So what this is doing is it's when I get the clamps in place, it's going to apply a lot of pressure right at the center of the joint as well as the ends of the joint when everything comes together. So a uh, simple block with a groove and taped on a little thing. You could either saw or joint or hand plane a curve onto the call, which I've done in the past. Um, this just works a lot faster. I picked this up. I may have picked this up from Bob Van Dyke because I know he does this. He just throws some business cards in there and just says – instant curve call. So let's, I'll say I got this from Bob. And then when you pull everything together, um, I'm able to clamp up and it's amazing how even on a, this pretty hefty oak call, how much 
clamping force there is to really bend that. So when you look close, you can really see um, just how much those calls bend and really apply pressure wow. right in the center. So, um, yeah, and I think for, for any glue op, it's pretty easy to kind of figure out what is the axis of clamping pressure I need across the joint and um, where do I need that pressure along the joint? And it's pretty easy to sort of figure out a call. And I just um, had a question from someone who says, you know, do you keep all of your clamping calls? And it's kind of, uh, you kind of do, but you end up, I end up tending to make new ones for the job at hand. Do you, uh, so I, I have a couple of questions about this. So you're using oak. Yeah. And your cabinet's oak, right? Yeah. But you wouldn't use an oak clamping call on a pine piece of furniture or you generally, don't you want your call to be a little bit softer than? I think, yeah, I think as a rule of thumb, that's really true, especially as the woods get softer. And one thing I didn't mention is I also taped a really thin shim on each end because my shims are made out of pine. Mm -hmm. For that exact reason where I didn't want the, the ends of the oak calls, I'm really clamping that down tight to really dig into the oak sides. I'm not sure it would have, but oak on oak, there was a good chance you're going to feel some dents. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, normally pine calls are sort of standard, but the scraps I had on hand that were exactly the right size happened to be oak. So, Well, I can tell you from experience, recent experience, Yes. if you're gluing up a pine toolbox, yeah. don't use ash calls. Okay. I, I had to break out the iron and spray bottle a little <laughs> bit recently because I get I was like wow that's really that's just cru I mean I I was shocked how much I was able to crush because yeah. <laughs> I I had a um a dovetail a set of dovetails that I was gluing up and um the next day I came in and that last pin was just a little bit loose I, I don't know if I didn't get enough clamping pressure uh -huh. on it or enough glue or whatever. So I was able to open it up a little bit, get some glue in there, and I really wanted to make sure I had enough clamping pressure sure. on it. And, yeah, I absolutely crushed it. But um, so... I think that's always a red flag. You know, like uh, tabletop glue-ups where it's sort of like long grain to long grain, you want a fair amount of clamping pressure. But any sort of carcass, drawer, cabinet glue-up, the clamps are not providing glue strength. They're not adding glue strength. All they're doing is they're holding the parts in position while the glue dries mm -hmm. because none of the joints, say like a mortise and tenon joint, gluing that joint tight end to end, you're not increasing the pressure on the walls, which is where all the, no. all the glue pressure yeah. is. So, you know, in that case, you know, I'll tend to, for dovetail drawers, if they come together and stay together, I won't put any clamps on them at all. And if I do have to glue up, say like a, a door frame with mortise and tenons, I'll put just enough pressure on to bring the joint together. And if it's really tight and I have to sort of sock it down to get it to seat, I'll loosen it back up so all my clamping pressure is as light as possible. Clamping pressure, though, is one of those things that everyone always says, oh, you'll know, or you're looking for the right amount of squeeze. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, no, I don't know, and I don't know how much squeeze out. And right about that much squeeze out, depending on how much glue I put on there, it's, it's, it is a learned skill. Yeah. Is there any, I mean... Um, well, again, if think in terms of what are the clamps doing? Are they applying pressure to the joint itself, to a glue joint? Yeah. In that case, pressure is important. More so than are you just holding parts in... In place. The correct proximity until the glue dries. So that's dovetails, mortise and tenons. Uh, um, then it's just... Is the joint closed? Then it's enough clamping pressure. Okay. So I think the, the glue bead has more to do with the amount of glue you're putting on, but you do kind of want to see if I'm gluing up like a tabletop or some sort of a panel with multiple boards, you'll want to see a little squeeze out there, I think. Yeah. That's pretty important. Okay. So joinery, don't crank them down. Yep. Be a little bit more subtle. Yes. Long grain and long grain panel glue ups, you can go to town. Uh, not but you don't want to squeeze out the glue, or you, all of your glue out. You won't squeeze out the glue, per se. The only time that matters is, like, epoxy actually needs, you can, I think, squeeze out too much epoxy. That's why a lot of times you sort of abrade the surfaces, because that's sort of like a mechanical glue joint you're creating. Mm -hmm. uh, yellow glue, I think you can just go to town as much as you want. The problem is, 
um, you probably don't need – we did an article where I think it said you need like a million pounds per square inch clamping pressure. And we got a lot of letters and comments from people it's like, you're crazy. Like you could never get that many clamps on there. And also you don't need that much, and I tend to agree with that. Okay. So um, – Want a, a good glue line? You want to make sure the joint's nice and tight. Um, I sock them down pretty good, mm -hmm. but um, don't kill myself. If if anybody uh, wants a little bit more insight on other creative calls, Ian Kirby had that awesome article. I think it's in like issue seven or something. But I I know I've put it up online, uh, just gluing up, and it's a lot of great early fine woodworking drawings really demonstrating where to put pressure, um, how to get calls. And it, the thing that I really like about it is they're not using parallel jaw clamps. They didn't have them back then. So it was all using, you know, pipe clamps. Right. To apply the pressure exactly where you need it. So I'll, I'll put a link to that. Yeah, and if you don't want to go quite that old school, Michael Fortune has done really good articles on gluing and glue-ups and calls. Um, and it really drives home the notion of sort of the axis of clamping pressure, which you always want perpendicular to the glue line itself, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily always parallel to the glue surfaces, which means, okay, I need a clamp here, but I also need a clamp in this orientation. So that's mm -hmm. a really cool article to check out as well. Cool. I will check that out myself. All right, so my all-time favorite tool of all time for this week is still yet to be in my possession. Uh, it's, it's probably my next purchase. I recently took a, I, it was like, I'm still coming down off the rush of taking this, this Boggs chair class at David Duyard's, um, with, it was, it was David, uh, teaching and Jeff Lefkowitz teaching and Jeff literally has written the book on, or the books on building, uh, the Boggs ladder back chairs. Brian Boggs, chair maker. Yeah. Yep. And, um, in the class notes, in the you know, in the tool list, of course, they say you don't need to bring anything, but if you're going to bring something, this is what you want. And they had some recommendations, and everybody I know has always recommended um, the Veritas. Um, what is that called? Spokeshave. Spokeshave. Yes. <laughs> um, and I've used the Veritas spokeshave, the flat bottom spokeshave. Uh -huh. It's a wonderful tool. They specifically said the curved bottom Lee Nielsen Boggs spoke shave. Okay. And I was like, eh, why, why? You know, and I didn't have, I, I don't have a, a spoke shave. So I was about to go purchase the Veritas, and I was like, well, these guys are specifically saying the, the Boggs. Right. Maybe I'll just go use it for a week and see if, I, if they're right. And, oh, wow, they're right. But there's a caveat. I don't think that the Boggs spoke shave is something that you pick. If you pick up a spoke shave once a month, I don't think that's the tool to use. Interesting. There is a lot of finesse. There's a lot of learning. You, 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 you know, it's a curved bottom. So you are just about setting the depth with the angle of attack. Um, there is no adjuster screws. So it's that it's your, if, if your blade is too deep, you're tapping the handle on the top of your shaving horse to retract the blade. Mm -hmm. If you need to deepen the cut, you tap the blade on the, on the back of your shaving horse to deepen the cut. It's one of those things that the, 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 the it's one of those tools that the first day I was using, it, I absolutely hated it. Right. I was like, okay. It just it's I'm at a Boggs chair class, so my spoke shave has to say Boggs on it or something. I don't know why <laughs> I'm using this tool right now. And the the longer I used it, the more in love I fell with the tool. Cause it was once you get used to it, once you once you find the bevel, once you figure out how to set the blade, you can make it so, it so easily and with with very little finicking you can make it do exactly what you need it to do. Right. And I think for a chair maker, it's the perfect spoke shave. Um, and it got to the point where, you know, we had the, the flat bottom and we had the curve and I went out of my way to use the curve because a, I only want to buy one spoke shave Sure. and you can do everything with the curve um, as opposed to 
you can't do everything on this chair with the flat bottom. And I will say this, the, the Lee Nielsen Boggs curved sole is far less curved than the Veritas. Mm-hmm. It's, it's much more subtle, so much so that you can, you can barely see it. You can barely look at it and see the curve. You have to really inspect it to okay. see that you're holding the curved. But wonderful tool. Um, just an absolute joy to use once you get used to it. But again, if you pick up a spoke shave every now and then, I don't think it's the way to go. Yeah, that's funny. You're sort of entering the realm of, well, this is what I have, but this is not what you should necessarily yeah. have but yeah yeah like if your goal is to make chairs yeah you you need to become one with your spoke shave at some point yeah so you might as well bite the bullet and get one spoke shave that can do everything once you learn it um you were working primarily on rounded surfaces everything the only time we ever used a square was to consistently measure three eighths of an inch okay. we never used it as a square uh, there is no squaring up in a box chair or a lot of chairs, I'm sure. But this was everything. There was no frame of reference to square. There was no nothing, nothing. There was there was no straight edge on the entire piece by the time you're done. Right. Um, and the shaping of the legs, the especially the front legs, you could turn them, but we did them all hand shaped. Right now. Because yeah. it was good practice for the back legs, which you can't turn because they're bent. Right. So it was that idea of by the time you get done shaping your front legs, you're ready for your back legs. I think the next chair I make, I will just turn the front legs because come on. So when you're working sort of radius parts with the spoke shave, did you intentionally tilt the blade so you had a heavy cut on one end and a lighter cut on the other I side? I don't think I got that in tune with my spoke okay. shave. Um, I was, the, and there there were times that I knew I was heavy on the right, so I would, yeah, you, I would, you start to you know, know your tool a little start bit. to start to move that direction if I, but I wasn't at the point where I could set the blade to do that. It was like, okay, the blade is here. I'm just going to work with it as right. it is right, right. now. Um, this class, there was a lot of, you know, making octagons, yep. making 16 faces, making 32 faces going around. Were you doing the whole thing with a spoke shave or were you busting out a draw knife for the year? No, there was a lot of draw knife work. Good deal. Yeah. And by the end of the class too, um, I, the, the two other, uh, attendees of the class, uh, one of them had already built a box chair. One of them has like builds a Windsor chair every other week. It seems like. He, he's built like five or six Windsor chairs. And um, so this this dude knew a draw knife. And I was finding myself consistently behind. Okay. I'd be over there. I'd be like, oh, I'm doing really nice over here, you know, having fun. And all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, they're done. Uh-oh, <laughs> they're waiting on me, you know. So I started to get a little bit more aggressive with my draw knife and go closer to the line with the draw knife and closer and closer. Right, and, yeah. Um, there was one moment where it was like, crank and i had some blowout oh. and thankfully it was barely above the line i was going for okay. but that another thing by the end of the week you knew your draw knife really really well now you said that you wanted a, a slightly rounded over edge on your draw knife so that brings a question are you bevel up or bevel down when you're using your draw knife okay so um jeff lefkowitz had has a buddy who reef refurbishes draw knives yeah and jeff brings like a dozen draw knives with them to class and they you know you you can use them but they all have a price tag on them right um so the first day we're all just like playing with every single draw knife known to mankind and you're you know and i my goal was to find a drawn a bevel up draw knife that i liked hmm. and i've wound up finding and and you you can change the angle of the handles on any draw knife to make it bevel up or bevel down hmm. so if you find a, a draw knife that you like but you want to bevel up or vice versa you put it in a vice and you take a big piece of inch and a quarter pipe or something and put it on the handle and just bend the handles hmm. so that it the, the angle of attack is what you need it to be um i wound up finding of course it was the most expensive one it was a, like a little seven inch witherby nice oh. And and I was just using it, and then I was like, it's trying to talk the other guys into buying it because I didn't want to buy it. And then one day I just bought it. Cool. 
cool. Um, but I was using a bevel. I was using a bevel down and having really good luck. Yeah. Um, and I got used to it, and so all of my draw knife work on this chair was with a bevel down. Um, but I have my great grandfather's draw knife, which um, right at the very end we ground and refurbed. And last night I took um, the bench crafted draw sharp, the Galbert. Oh, right. tool to yeah. it and that i'm setting up bevel up so i have one of each okay. the general consensus is you want one of each huh i when i learned i took my uh, chair making class with jenny alexander way back and the thing I, I came out from that is that um i and i learned bevel down and then you can have a flat back and a flat um hone a flat bevel on it because with the bevel down you can still lever this the draw knife out of the cut if you need to whereas if it's flat side down or bevel up you have to round over that blade so you can still lever that out of the cut if you want to yeah and yeah so if you don't have a little bit of a back bevel right we call it to to the back or a dubbing um you you're stuck right with that one. So, uh, Galbert's draw sharp automatically adds a little bit oh, of a really? back bevel. Okay. So you're not referencing off the very, very back of exactly the blade. Yep. same, same way with the ruler trick or anything like yep. that. You're just consistently sharpening that back cause you can set it to a number and, yep. and hit it every time. Oh, cool. So I think most people, Curtis Buchanan is sharpening his draw knife by hand on wet stones, and you. Know, but I think a lot of people are really. I know Jeff Lefkowitz and David Duyard. They were both adopters of the draw sharp, and that was one reason is that you could easily get that dubbed back or or that back bevel, and consistently do it. Yeah, um, you're not relying on the leather to give a certain amount as you strop it exactly. to give you that dub. Right. So. Well, I'm glad you picked that spoke shape because it, it really illustrates. I have the Veritas. I recommend the Veritas. I also recommend the flat bottom. And you are not alone. Well, yeah, but it, I mean, that, that's my, a fairly universally recommended. But it doesn't mean it's the it's the better spoke shape yeah. or the ideal spoke shape because you made a really good argument why a rounded bottom spoke shape without the twin depth adjusters works really well and works fine. So. Granted, on day one, I wanted a Veritas with the adjusters. <laughs> uh, all right. Cool. So let's, what are we moving on to here? Where are we? Cool. Okay, so question number three. My stupid thing on the PowerPoint does not tell me what we are doing. Okay, so I recently made my first shooting board modeled after Mike's shooting board. With the sliding speed square for miters. My fence is dead square, checked with multiple hardware store squares, but my but my cuts have yet to yield a square result. The consistent result is a cut that is high on the fence side of the board. After squaring and resquaring many times, I'm at a loss. What am I doing wrong? Asks Wes. Mike? Um well, I mean, I'm I'm not entirely convinced you're square, but I'll take you at at face value. But um, sh if he's shouldn't the if he's using a square to square up his fa his fence. Yeah. If he uses that same square after he's done shooting an edge of a board, shouldn't it be consistent at least? It might not be square, but it should be consistent. Yeah, I mean. You always use a square to set your fence, but you always test for square off the workpiece. Yeah. So I won't say, so if I put the square, if I put the square up to my fence and say, this is really square, I make a cut and then I check the workpiece with the square and it's not square. My thought pattern is not, well, it is, the fence is square. Why is this cut isn't square? It's more the cut isn't square. So the fence isn't square. Yeah. The ultimate test is the end piece. So... It's like, okay, you're setting for square, but the end piece shows me I'm high at the top, which means I need to, sh you know, angle it a little bit or shim a little piece of tape 
toward the right end of the fence to kick the workpiece down. Mm -hmm. So it's more, I'm always, the workpiece is my definition of square. My fence and square is not my definition of square. Okay. Um, so, I mean, but at the same time, you could be really square, but um, something in your technique is kind of throwing you off a little bit. And it isn't a natural thing. It, it does take a little bit of... Um, finesse to use a shooting board in the proper manner and um, what's really important is you want to reference your your hand plane um, not necessarily pushing in against the little rabbit um, on your stop but really pushing down so you're referencing off the side and you want to make just a really smooth cut without angling your plane into the fence and then the workpiece, um, you're basically, you want to feed the workpiece into the plane. You don't want to lever the plane into the workpiece when you're shooting. So what you want to do is put your hand plane on its little rabbit, tied up against it, but then bring your workpiece up to the sole of the plane ahead of the blade. So you're not sticking the workpiece out beyond the little rabbit to plane it. You're putting the plane against your rabbit on your shooting board, you're moving your workpiece flush with the sole of the plane so you can take a single shaving pass. Mm -hmm. And so then you're constantly sort of in very small increments, you're feeding the workpiece into the plane without ever pushing it out beyond the little rabbit. Because if you do that, you're going to end up taking creating an angle cut. And I invariably start off pushing my board too far out. Too far out. Yeah. And, and it's all hanging out. Yeah, yep. And then also it's beyond the fence, which is kind of your zero clearance support. So you end up getting some blowout on the back end of your workpiece anyway. Mm -hmm. So if your fence is in really good shape um, and you just have your plane in the right position and you just push the workpiece against the sole of the plane without pushing out beyond that little edge of the shooting board, um, you're going to have better luck that way. Initially, my thought was that his blade was not set. It could parallel to the bottom of the plane. But I mean, that will give you not square, sort of top to bottom, yeah. but not end to end. And yeah. this sounds like more like an end to end issue. Yeah. Um, the other way you can check is, you know, so you make a cut until you, you're cut all the way across, then flip your workpiece over so the opposite edge is against your fence and make another pass. And if it's just like tick, 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 you're taking off just a corner, yeah, it means you're definitely not square. Okay. So, so you, same way if you make a cut on a table saw and you flip one over on yeah. the flat edge. Ideally, you, you'd have the, okay. you make a, a full-length pass on the end grain of a board. You flip it over and you'll make a second full-length pass. That means... That's square. That sounds pretty square to yeah. me. Um, is it always the case? Eh, no, but... And then there's body language and then you know kind of how to shove things to get it square. And um, kind of like your spoke shave, there's, there's a little bit of play in everything. Even on a table saw, um, on any tool, there's a little bit of... You know, a little body English, a little finesse, a little understanding of, of the pressure you're trying to impart, whether it's sawing straight for dovetails or shooting square or even making a really good rip cut on a table saw. It's all about understanding the tool and um, using it in a way to dial in beyond the adjustments, the performance of the tool. I feel like I'm starting to hit that point with a table saw. Right on. And because... You know, at, at the shop, we've got, um, there is that, uh, that miter gauge that is just 90 degrees and you can set it to 45 degrees or something. Right. There's no dialing in adjustments or anything yeah. like that. And that, when that thing is dead on, it's dead on. And the same way that I always, you, you, you're a guitar player, you know how all of a sudden you can't get your guitar in tune? Yes. And it's really just your, your hearing tuning better than you used to or uh, you just can't get your guitar <laughs> yes. all right well a lot of okay. guitar players reach a point where <laughs> they just can't get their guitar in tune it's, it's okay. just the fact that they are hearing the the inaccuracies and the subtleties more okay i feel like i'm starting to get there with cool. the table saw where it's like no this this miter gauge is, is square the blade is square but i am subtly pulling something somewhere right yeah and you know, I, I I try blaming it on the tool. I try blaming it on the square. That's not the square. Um, and it just turns out, no, if I go at a 
more consistent feed rate. If I, you know, th- there's a lot of variables yes. that affect your cuts, and I'm just starting to get that now. Yeah, there's enough slop in the track. There's enough flex in the head, and especially a long piece where you're shaving off just one end, but then you have three feet of stock yep. sort of lever, and it's all. Yeah, it's yeah. all that. A, that. a square setup does not guarantee square no, cuts. No, not at all. Not at yeah. all. That's why, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I don't want to beat up this point again, but the notion of hand or power, it's like, man, you're just really leaving out such a deeper, richer conversation if you say either or, because that's just, okay, number one, it, it's never is, but number two, you know, a table saw, you think, oh, that's automatic. That's doing the job for me. That's production work. It's like, nah, it's a tool and you really got to know it and learn it yeah. and finesse it. And it's just as intricate and temperamental as and any body hand mechanics plane. mechanics play into it just yeah. as much as a hand plane. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's really good if you really know how to tune and sharpen and use a hand plane. I think that's essential. I think you really need to know how to work with your table saw because you can do absolutely amazing things with it. Like, I love my hand plane. I love my table saw. It's not like, oh, I have to use a table saw until I get to the bench and then I can use my hand plane. Sorry, I love my table saw too. So, <laughs> I love your old table saw. Well, I still have I'm glad <laughs> because that was a former love of mine as well. So. I will give her a good home eventually. Good deal. All right. So uh, I need to take a minute and uh, and not need to. I want to actually <laughs> okay. take a minute and thank audible.com for sponsoring this episode. Uh, if you go to audible.com slash shop talk live, you'll get a free audio book that uh, we know that Jeff's a fan of audio books and we know that Mike's a fan of audio books, but uh, I'm kind of new to them and Recently, I listened to um, a friend of Fine Woodworking's, Peter Korn, yeah. has a book, uh, Why We Make Things and Why It Matters, The Education of a Craftsman. And I was just searching around, and I saw Peter Korn, and I was like, well, that's the guy who runs Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, and I know that he's written a lot of books for Taunton, and they're really well-received and everything, so... I read into the synopsis a little bit more and it was, oh, okay, so this is, you know, kind of his his take on what's important in the in the, for a craftsman, not in the shop. It's it's not talking about hand planning, it's talking about why he built things. He he builds things. And um I I was gonna read um I was gonna read a, a couple of paragraphs, but it's silly and my the guy who reads it on the audiobook is way better than I could ever do. And then I thought, well, maybe I can put an MP3 up, but I think that's illegal. But, um, well, hit me with something. <clears throat> All right. So, the origin of fulfillment. I may not have been happy turning those seven table legs, but that was no bar to fulfillment. Happiness and fulfillment feel like distinct states of mind to me. I'll just leave it at that. Huh. So, basically, his argument was that. Like, he didn't like turning. I don't like turning. Yeah. I can really, I, I understand that. But it's the means to the end of making the table, which makes him feel fulfilled. Yeah. So he doesn't necessarily enjoy every moment in the workshop, but he enjoys the end, the end he enjoys the entire process and the, and the means to the end. Yeah. And feels fulfilled at the end of it. And it's, it's, it's a really cool, it's a really cool, um, narrative to he really interesting guy um went through a lot of hardships in life and but was furniture was the the theme throughout his entire Mm -hmm. life and um had some health issues and but always focused on his art and his craft and um i i would equate this book a lot to um zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance or whatever that book is Mm -hmm. but um where it's it's not it's definitely not a how to it's definitely not something that you would read to become a better craftsman but you might listen to it or read it to become a more um fulfilled craftsman or a more um someone who who looks at their shop time differently um someone who because you're always saying that you know making your work mean something and yes. everything that you do. I, I feel like he, he shares that. 
uh, thought. It's it was it was a really great book. It was um, one of those I listened to it in the gym. I listened to it in the shop, and when it was done, I was really wanting more. Yeah, I, you know, I, I wanted to listen to it again, and I might actually. So that's really cool. Yeah. And I think just that that one line you read really touches on I think a huge aspect of woodworking, which is that it's not. It's not a hobby. It's not an idle pursuit in terms of, boy, this is really fun. Okay, sometimes it is. But like like 1% of the time in the shop, this is really fun taking this one plane shaving. Like when the plane is super sharp and the board is really well behaved, okay, that was fun. Yeah. But now 99% of the stuff, the gluing or the sweeping or the cutting or the laying out, you don't think of it, man, I'm having fun here. But there is that sense of, he said, fulfillment or achievement or accomplishment. There's something deeper and richer about making something that mm-hmm. isn't just I'm happy doing this. But it's because it's like, wow, Mike, you must like cutting dovetails because they're in like every freaking piece of furniture you make. It's like, no, I hate cutting dovetails. Yeah. Who would like cutting dovetails? But it's that notion of, okay, don't hate it, but I also don't think – awesome, I get to cut a dovetail right now. It's just part of that process of making something and the fulfillment involved in that accomplishment is amazing and far more gratifying than, you know, doing something that makes you happy per se. When, when I was making that chair, it was like if I, if I literally had two nights worth of dreams about octagons, <laughs> it was like if I... If I if I think about an octagon one more time, I'm gonna scream. And there was, you know, it's like there's that romantic aspect of you're sitting at a shave horse, you whisper thin shavings, and everything. Yeah. But man, there was a lot of times it's like, oh god, I just want to get to the <laughs> next part, please. But it's like when I look at that chair now, yeah. it's like I hand shaped that, I did all that, and it's like it was worth it. Yeah, it was worth it. And I wasn't happy when I was struggling with with the spoke shave settings or anything like that, but. It, I was fulfilled at the end of it. So it, it, it's an interesting look. Yeah. Uh, definitely worth uh, listening to. Yeah. Um, so if anyone is interested, you can uh, go to audible.com slash shop talk live and you can get this. Uh, you can get why we make things and why it matters uh, for free or any other book. Cool. Basically, you get one audible credit. So uh, check it out. I know. All right, so let's move on to another squeeze-out question or another discussion. This one is from Daniel. A few months ago, I made a small side table out of cherry for my wife. The table came out great, but I've noticed in the past weeks that the glue line has turned into an obnoxious orange color. The table is sat in direct sunlight since finished. The dowels have a starburst effect around them, and the glue line between the boards and the panel are now clearly visible. I was wondering if you'd experience this. I had thought I'd sand sand it enough to remove any residual glue, but perhaps not. Now that the project has been finished with armor seal, would would it work to sand off the finish to remove the glue marks and then refinish it? In the end, I want to make this project look great again. Any thoughts would be most helpful. Daniel. So, post a picture or two this is a weird one it is kind of weird because normally if you have glue squeeze out it's going to be lighter compared to the you know the unsealed surfaces where the finish tends to soak in and this is kind of more orange um i'm still gonna say and i don't quite know why but um let's say you didn't get all of the all the way down through the squeeze out because it's happening both on the glue lines and around these dowels. And to your um, um, to your question, can I just um, kind of refinish it or sand it down, sand out the finish? Yeah, do it. Yeah, um, get it all off. Really get down there and try it again. My guess is, especially since you're using just a type on to glue which I've never seen do this. Um, I'm guessing you haven't dyed this, that it's, a, that it's the natural color. Um, take it down to bare wood and try it again. My guess is that it's that's going to take care of things for you. That's about all I can think of. Yeah, I, this is interesting. It almost looks like, um, like the cherry is aged, except at this glue line. But my question is, normally 
whenever it happened this morning, whenever I apply, especially an oil finish to something, which Armor Seal is, you generally see a glue spot immediately. It Turn, turns white. Yeah. Yeah. Or in comparison to the surrounding surfaces. Yeah. And I, I truly believe Daniel didn't see that. So there's, there, there's some sort of leaching or something going on, but and I wonder if it's an interaction between the walnut and the cherry. But I would I would guess that as well. But I haven't heard that from walnut. I've used like Paduke where I've had Paduke details, and then I hit it with a coat of shellac, and the alcohol actually leaches the color out of the Paduke, and it will stain the surrounding woods, which was really bizarre. That's the only time I'd seen that happen, but I've never heard or experienced that with walnut. And he had that along a glue line, uh, yeah, which was yeah. just cherry it's, to cherry. So no, that that if anyone has seen this before, uh, you know, we'll, we'll post these in the show notes. Yeah. If anyone has seen this before, let us know. Post a comment on uh, on the website. Yeah, and I would I would just say, Daniel, if you don't want to like refinish the whole thing, I take the top off, flip it over. I'm guessing it happened on the bottom as well. I'm I don't really... think he can take the top off because it's pegged. Oh, maybe. Okay. Um, I don't know. Well, maybe you can take it off and just sort of scrape along the glue line with a scraper to yeah. really get down to bare wood. Just throw, you know, another coat of uh, finish on there. And if it takes care of it, that's your answer. Just yeah. go ahead and refinish the top. Good luck. That's a Yeah. And definitely let us, let us know what happens. Yeah. Yeah. We're curious about and that. And thanks because I've never seen that before. So. <laughs> Something new. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our all-time favorite technique of all time. I'm going to go first. Please do. Because mine's stupid. What? I just went, like, and you, you had said yesterday, oh, you've got, like, probably three dozen techniques from, from your class. And I yeah. do, but they're all, like, very, very specific um, to chairs. So this morning I was applying oil to my chair. And okay. I remembered. So I like to use little squeeze bottles yeah. uh, of finish. And um, I had found that even though I put the, the cap back on, yeah, they generally get gunked up and... and they don't squirt the next day when I go to put another coat of finish on. Huh. What kind of finish you throw in there? Uh, polyurethane and okay. linseed oil and thinner. Um, so it's a, it's a mix. But um, <clears throat> so one day I decided randomly I cut the finger off the glove I just took off my hand and used it as a uh, barrier. We'll say. Oh, so you unscrewed the so cap. I unscrewed the cap. Yeah. Put the put the finger of the glove over it. Screw the cap back on. Yeah. And this bottle I hadn't used in since my last project, maybe a couple months ago that I put oil on. And I I opened up the finishing cabinet in the in the shop and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I wonder if that's still good. And it was still great. It was still good to go. The bottle huh. squirted. The finish hadn't hadn't, hadn't the, gelled up. Or hadn't anything. gelled up or anything like that. So there's something to cutting the glove off of your finger and sticking it on the threads of the squeeze bottle huh. to keep your uh, finish intact in your squeeze bottle squeezing. How about that? Yeah. Okay. A little weird, though. Right? Okay. Yeah. And uh, here's a wider shot in case anyone has... Oh, oh look at that chair I made. <laughs> look at the chair. The, the finish ball just happens to be sitting on there. That, that's, that's, that's gorgeous. That's incredible. You made that. I, I made that chair, yeah. That's awesome. It's pretty awesome. Yep. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Mike? Huh. What? Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, mine is... Uh, um, it It's related to my uh, favorite tool, which is a clamping call for gluing up. So my favorite technique also has to do with gluing up because this uh, case clip was pretty convoluted in that you have two sides, a top and a bottom. Then you have a horizontal kind of divider sitting below the drawers. You have two vertical dividers for the drawers. You also have two lower vertical dividers to divide the bottom space up uh, for two doors on either end and bookshelves in the center. So there's a whole lot going on there. Yeah. And um, um, in the past, I may have try <laughs> tried to do... Oh, you also have a top apron at the back of the top. And a little kicker just keep um, coming below at the bottom, the bottom yeah. at the front. So there's just a lot going on. And um, back in my younger days, I may have tried to get this going all at once. This was one of my favorite Mike Pekovich Instagram captions of all time. <laughs> I don't remember. It was something like, 
back back when I was younger, I, I probably would have tried to do this all at once. But there was a lot of things I tried <laughs> when I was younger <laughs> <laughs> that I wouldn't try now. Yes, yeah, uh, very true. So um, rather than a single glue up. Um, I broke this down into three separate glue-ups. Um, none of those three glue-ups was particularly difficult. I mean, the last one was was a little bit hairy, but um, I started out by gluing the bottom and the vertical dividers to the drawer shelf horizontal divider oh. thing. So I created sort of a sideways H. And then I glued um, the drawer dividers and the top to that center unit. So I have basically all my three horizontals plus all my vertical guys. And then the final glue up was to bring that center unit to the sides with the apron and the kicker and the opposite side. And that's what that final glue up was. So um, trying to minimize the number of glue joints at any given stage of the game. Okay. I was trying to imagine how you how you broke that down, but right. that makes a lot more sense than what I was going to do. That would be an exciting project because it kind of all comes together right there. It does. And also, um, because none of the joints, the, either the tenons stick out or all the surfaces along the front are inset wherever they meet, there is no uh, flushing or sanding or smoothing of parts after it's together. So um, this will actually be technique- one B, Ooh. which is pre-finishing, obviously surface prep, but um, on something like this, okay, number one, I can pre-finish everything because I'm not flushing surfaces after the fact. Number two, um, I want to at least pre-finish uh, with, at the bare minimum, a wash coat of shellac to keep the glue off the joints and everything as they come through. Um, but in order to do that, I also want it to fume the parts but I wanted to fume the parts before I pre-finish the parts. So I dry fit the entire thing, made a tent. I fumed the entire piece dry fit without glue. I banged it apart. I pre-finished all the parts before glue up. So all the interior parts, they're done done with finish. The exterior I plan on hitting with another coat or two of finish, but it's already Along, it's already fumed, pre-finished, two coats of uh, water locks on there before glue up. Now it comes together. I peg everything together, uh, a couple more coats, and it's done, done. But it's really cool because you go from parts, and right when you're, you pull the clamps off the glue up, it's like, oh, it's a finished piece of furniture yeah. already. So Put the glass and you're done. Yeah. So that worked out really well. Really impressive. There's a lot going on there. Good. Cool. Um, all right. We've got one last question. Uh, when sharpening chisels, do you put a micro bevel on them or just the standard 25 degree? Depends. All right. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Next. Uh, if I am honing by hand and I'm using a grinder or a wet wheel grinder to put a hollow grind on the tool, basically that hollow grind when you rest that bevel on a flat surface, because of that hollow, you have a little ridge along the front, which is in contact with the flat surface or your stone, and the ridge at the back is in contact as well. Um, so if I'm sharpening by hand, I always make sure those two edges of contact are flat against the stone in order to maintain a consistent angle as I work through my stones. Mm -hmm. So in that case, whatever I'm honing at is exactly the same angle as I ground at because I'm resting that sort of concave bevel right on the surface itself. If I'm using a honing guide, I always kick up the angle five degrees steeper than the angle I grind at so that I'm honing just a really, really small area to get it sharp. Um, and I don't need to rest the whole bevel flat like I do when I'm... I'm uh, honing by hand because the wheel on the, the honing gauge is acting like that, the, that back bevel. Do you ever hone by hand? Um, on occasion. Really? Yeah. A short blades. Learn something new every day about you, Mike. Um, I did it forever that way. And then I went to just using a honing guide for uh, plain irons cause they have to be sharp, sharp. 
and chisels sometimes didn't fit in the honing guide. So I always did, did my chisels by hand, and then as I switched to honing guides, which handle chisels a little bit uh, more easily, um, I've sort of merged to that way. But yeah, I'd like to break it out by hand now and then. Nice. Um, do you have a chisel that you do at 30 degrees or 35 degrees or 25? You know, do you change up your bevel angle based on use? I don't. Um, I always grind for plain irons. I always grind at 25, hone at 30. For chisels, I always grind at 30 and hone at 35. Okay. And 35 might sound um, like it's a little steep for, say, like a, a paring chisel for end grain. But I find if it's really sharp, it does a good job. And that that 35 degree angle is just a little more durable as an all around use tool than something that's a little bit lower than that. And then for like um, like a mortising chisels, which I have two of and I never use them, they're steeper than that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think that does it for this episode. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsor, audible.com. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial by signing up at audible.com slash shop talk live. Please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your woodworking friends and neighbors. Shop Talk Live is dependent on your questions, so make sure to send them into shoptalk at taunton.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook, and look for all of us on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening, and have fun in the shop. Did we make it? I knew that card was getting close. www.audible.com slash shop talk live. Cool. You know, like we're never supposed to comment on ads. We got in trouble for that. So we're just supposed to be like silent and pretend like well, that's why it's not. That's why this is before because we'll just put up a logo and it's just that. I like audiobooks so I know. I'm just saying. That's what I don't like is when we do an ad and I actually have something nice to say <laughs> <laughs> and you can't say it, but forget it. I like <laughs> Well, don't worry. There's, there's a mid read. Right up. So, and Jeff has a microphone. Jeff's like an audiobookaholic. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't want to go there. Jeff's listening to an audiobook right now. <laughs> <laughs>